you know what? I'm going to go straight to Matthew. If you would just go to the Matthew passage. So Matthew chapter 2. So you're getting the full Christmas story this morning. How's that? So this is, you had Luke. Now this is Matthew's account. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, when Herod was king, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star and as it, when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was alarmed. All Jerusalem with him. He gathered together all the people's chief priests and experts in the law, and he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, because this was written through the prophet. You, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are certainly not least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and found out from them exactly when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report to me so that I may also go and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and then the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with overwhelming joy. And after they went into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And since they had been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. And after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream. He said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod will search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. And this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he was furious. He issued orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and all the surrounding countryside. From two years old and under, this was in keeping with the exact time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And the angel said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. But those who are trying to kill the child are dead. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. When we heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, had succeeded his father as ruler in Judea, he was afraid to go there. And since he'd been warned in a dream, he went to the region of Galilee. When he arrived there, he settled in a city called Nazareth. So what was spoken through the prophets was fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, I ask that you would speak through me today. And uh, Lord, wake us up as your people, that we may live in these times and these days in the light of the guidance of your word. May it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In your name, amen. Once again, Happy New Year 2023. Now you got to get used to writing that on checks and, and typing that. 2023. So what's this new year going to hold? And what was this last year like for you? I mean, we can probably recall all the ups and the downs, the good and the bad. Yeah, and whenever we consider a new year, you think of, you know, new opportunities, fresh starts. You know, it, there's always a sense of cleansing and things are new. You know, and this is when the New Year's resolutions come in. You know, you're going to lose weight or you're going to work out. And, of course, you, then you don't aren't doing it anymore by February, but you have good intentions on this day. But, you know, we also have thoughts about, you know what, there's some, maybe some scary stuff. 
looming on the horizon. Um, there's some dangers and threats in the world that maybe we're like, I'm not really sure where we're going in the world in, as a nation. Maybe even in our lives, there's some things we're like, oh, I'm not really ready to face this. You know, in the last week, I noticed that news articles were already priming the pump to get people ready for a bad new year. I don't know if you saw any of them. So here is one from The Hill, which as publications go, is left-leaning. But listen, this is the title. The bad news. 2023 is already shaping up to be a very, very bad year. They literally put in two varies. It's like, oh great, you know, just sour it before the new year is even here. So listen to this. As the new year approaches, it's time to consider how 2023 might unfold. Of course, the starting point, the contemporary context, would be the recent history of COVID lockdowns. Massive government spending and inflation and constrictive energy policies driving up energy and food prices, as well as most downstream prices, and wiping out retirement savings, Fed strategies depressing the market, war in Ukraine threatening nuclear confrontation, China's rising political aggression, political corruption of government institutions, and apparent government-led attacks on the First Amendment, I wouldn't say not apparent, I'd say, yes, they did attack, have been attacking our First Amendment rights, at least according to the Twitter files. There's a whole lot of interesting stuff there. Rising urban crime, a surge in illegal immigration, bringing drugs, crime, a disrupted labor market, a growing culture war on women with rising political activism of the trans community, and I would add, a continuing war against the unborn and young children. And chaos in the American educational system, leading to a sharp decline in student performance. Yeah, we're disgusted by what we're seeing in the public schools these days. And, and then he ends, few would call 2020, 2021, and 2022 good years for America. Some might call them disasters. And 2023 may well be worse. Oh, how about that? Happy New Year! Wow, don't you love starting on a sour note like that? <laughs> but you know what? As followers of Jesus, we do need to be awake. We do need to have the spiritual discernment to see what's going on in the world. What is on the horizon? And yet, to go into that future without fear, without anxiety, trusting the provision of King Jesus for us in this new year. He will provide, he will protect, and he will be our peace, no matter what we face. And so as we look at our text in Matthew 2, and I'm going to focus on um, the flight to Egypt, the second half of it. And once again, if you didn't get an outline, you can pick it up afterwards. Um, you know, the first thing, when you look at the text, is how the enemy and the powers of darkness want to destroy what God is doing. And the same is true today as it was then. Jesus had just been born. God's son had come into the world. Emmanuel, God with us. And, and, and the angels were the first to get the birth announcement with the glory shining from heaven. And they rushed to Bethlehem and they saw the baby lying in a manger with Mary and Joseph. This is the promised king of Israel who'd come to rescue the world. This is Emmanuel, God with us. You know, and the thought of, wow, God's fulfilling his promises. No sooner did that happen. Herod wants to destroy this child. Satan and the powers of darkness want to devour him. So it all started when these Persian 
astrologers, magi, or wise men show up to town in Jerusalem. They're like, hey, we're looking for this newborn baby who's the long-promised king of, of Israel. And Herod freaks out. Because they had seen a star, and likely from Persia, when David and company in Babylonian exile, and then Persia were there, had left knowledge of the scriptures and interpreting dreams from the Lord, they knew from Numbers chapter 24 there would be a star that would rise out of Judah and a scepter would come from Israel. There would be a star as a sign that the promised Messiah king of Israel had come to rescue the world. And so here they are. We're looking for that king. Herod freaks out. You have to understand, if you study Herod, he was a maniacal, um, paranoid psychopath. He was half Jew, but he ruled under the sway of the Roman Empire. And any threat to his rule and reign, I mean, he ruled with a tight iron fist of control. He raised the taxes. He taxed them to death. Yeah, we're familiar with that. Uh, but anything that threatened his power, he would eliminate people. So that meant his wife. That meant two or three sons. That meant some Sadducees. People on his staff, he's, you know, he was so suspicious, like, take him out. So then to hear news that, what, baby's been born? He's going to be king? Get rid of him. And uh, so orders. Now, at this time, when the wise men come, it's been about two years. You know, you, we're used to the nativity scene where you got the shepherds, you got the wise men. Now, they didn't all happen at the same time. So it was likely about two years later because while they were in the house, this house likely in Bethlehem, some will say it's in Nazareth, but we'll say they're still in Bethlehem. And uh, so these magi, these Persian astrologers are looking for him and uh, they know that it's Bethlehem, the prophet Micah had said. And, uh, and so Herod's like, okay, you, you just report back to me where he is because I want to go worship him. And then when he finds out, oh, they outwitted me. They're, they're not reporting back, those wise men. Kill all the babies. Two years old and younger. I, I want you to imagine that. I mean, that kind of diabolical evil. He's so jealous of his reign. It's like, I don't want even an infant child who might be a future ruler to threaten me, wipe out all the children. No regard for life whatsoever. And that's what it was like back then. No regard for life whatsoever. And But behind King Herod is the demonic powers of evil. Because as you heard a couple weeks ago from Revelation 12, the, the vision that John the Apostle had of a woman clothed with the sun with 12 stars as a crown and a moon under her feet. It was a picture of Israel and, and an Israelite woman named Mary. And this woman in John's vision then gave birth to a child and it said, and then the dragon, the seven-headed dragon with ten horns, is a picture of Satan, the devil, the powers of evil, that he is waiting to devour this child when it's born. And this is what he had done way back at the Exodus. When, when, when Moses was born, remember when Pharaoh was threatened by the Hebrews? He's like, kill all the Hebrew babies. And see, and this is what the powers of evil do. They want to destroy life. They want to destroy God's created order. And they want to destroy his plan of salvation, starting with Jesus. And you see, it's no different today. Now, I was in seminary. I had a professor tell me, he said, we live in a culture now in America of death. A culture that destroys life and devalues life. And that, those words that I heard in like 1999 have become more true today than ever before. You know, not only over the years the death of countless unborn children but death in so many other ways. Take, for instance, euthanasia. Do you know the number one cause of death in Canada right now is what? Euthanasia. 
You can, for almost any reason, 18 years old and older now, you can choose to end your life. For any reason. And, and so now you have the disabled, you have the poor, uh, you know, those that are now inconvenient to society, their lives are being ended. You have 18-year-olds uh, who are like, you know what, I don't like life, I'm depressed. And you don't need parental permission at that point. It's like, I'm just going to exit life. And you can. Heard an interview with one man who was on disability, and he's like, my life's so miserable, I'm, I just, I signed up to end it. That's where we're at. And this is the agenda that more and more countries are giving into. Not to mention, if, if you consider a diabolical, satanic agenda that is behind this destruction of life, you know, that this even gets to the whole transgender agenda of saying, oh, you know what, the whole distinction between male and female, oh, it's, it's fluid or it doesn't matter, and we can just confuse that, distort it, or destroy it. And actually, you have an agenda to wipe out gender. Now, if, if you were to see Baphomet, which is the satanic goat-headed figure, in many images, it is a transgender figure. The breasts of a woman, the man of a body. And if, then you listen to the World Economic Forum and their agenda for transhumanism. Harari is the name of their, their chief scientist. By 2050, we will no longer have humanity, if, if you listen to his speech, because first we're going to start with implanting chips in your brain. And then, you know, this whole agenda that is to wipe out humanity and usher in artificial intelligence and AI. I mean, if you go down this rabbit hole, you're like, there is, it is the scariest form of Death, destruction of humanity, you know, social credit system. And then, well, okay, you've had too much beef, so now you don't get any more. And we read that because of the chip that we've implanted in you, and we know where you go and what you buy. You know, this is this Herodian, satanic system of control that wants to destroy life. Life is God is given it from the womb all the way to the grave and, and what God has created male and female and, and to live with the freedom that he's given us and Satan wants to stomp on that. He wants to wipe it out. These are some of the issues that you're going to see more and more in 2023. It's scary if you really go down this rabbit hole. And this is the enemy, the dragon, who in Revelation 12, not only wants to devour the woman's child, wants to devour the children of the woman, his people, the, the people of Jesus, the followers of Jesus. But here's the thing. And, and you know what? You can get lost in all kinds of conspiracy theories and what's going on in the world of course, you can listen to the words right from their mouth, their agenda to stamp out Christianity, implement a, a one-world religion. And, you know, you can bury yourself deep into that and go into the rabbit hole where there is a lot of fear and darkness and despair. Don't go there. Realize, okay, there are forces of evil that not only want to destroy God's good created order that want to destroy life, that want to consume and destroy his church, his people, and the saving plan of Jesus. But we don't need to be afraid. Now, everything I just said, as scary as any of that may have been, it's like, we don't need to be afraid. Because he will provide and protect us. And keep us safe. Just as that infant Messiah King was kept safe along with Mary and Joseph. It's interesting. The father kept baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph safe through angelic direction and provision. So in, in Matthew 2, 
after the wise men were gone, this is in verse 13, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream. He said, get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod will search for the child in order to kill him. And they go to Egypt, and then when the time is ready, they come out, and then when Herod dies, the angel says, you can go back. But this time they go to Nazareth. Now, something that's interesting, Herod seeks to kill Jesus. He's the one that dies. God protects his son. He protects Jesus and Mary and Joseph. You know, and the message there is these rulers with all their diabolical plans of evil. You know, I, I listened to this lecture from a, a scientist Harari of the World Economic Forum about transhumanism and chips and all this. And I'm like, you know what? All these rulers and their diabolical agendas, they're going to come to an end. Psalm 2, it says, you know, the nations may conspire, but the Lord mocks them. He laughs at them. They will come to an end, but the rule and reign of King Jesus will continue. It will endure. It will advance. It will expand as he seeks to redeem his lost and fallen creation and bring people back to himself. So it's interesting, you have an allusion to that with their going to Egypt and coming out of Egypt. Verse 14, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. And this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now that's from Hosea 11. And it's not a prophecy. It's not like... Out of Egypt, I will call my son, and his name will be Jesus. That passage was speaking of God's people, Israel, in Egypt. His people, they called my son, that they were in bondage under Pharaoh in back-breaking slavery, and he raised up Moses, and through Moses, led them out in the Exodus to free them from Pharaoh out of Egypt through the Red Sea waters to be his people, his representative people of the nations. But... They failed. They sinned. So now comes a faithful Israelite. You could say, Jesus is Israel reduced to one. He's the embodiment of Israel, what they should have been. He's the embodiment of humanity, what God created us to be, but we haven't been. We have failed. We have sinned. We've turned away from him. And here comes the Son of God, the Son of Man. The embodiment of faithful Israel, faithful humanity. And right here, Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving us a clue. Oh, look, out of Egypt I called my son. This baby, this God in human flesh, he's going to bring about a new exodus to free humanity, to free us from the bondage in slavery of our sin to the powers of darkness and death, which he would do at the cross. That he has freed us in his suffering, in his death, in his body that he assumed and took on and was born in this world as a baby. That he freed us. And brought us out of sin. He brought us out of the grip and power of the enemy. He freed us from death. And he brought us by his resurrection into his life-giving, everlasting reign. With the hope of all things being restored. And all people by faith being restored to the Heavenly Father. That deliverance is what we hold on to. Even if we don't always see it today, we know we have it in Jesus. Whatever goes on in the world, whatever is going to happen in this world, whatever governments and rulers and their tyrants, along with well-meaning, good, righteous people in government working for the good of the people, Jesus, King Jesus, is your deliverance. He is is our provision. He is our protection. He is our peace and the hope of what is to come. Even if we are despised and rejected by the world, 
So it's interesting, at the very end of the text, they arrive in Nazareth, and the last verse, when he arrived there, he settled in a city called Nazareth. So what was spoken through the prophets was fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. What does that mean? Bible scholars have wondered that for years because there is no Bible, actual Bible passage in the Old Testament that says he'll be called a Nazarene. And so some have thought, well, maybe that word um, Nazareth is related to Netzer, which is branch. You know, he's the branch of Jesse. Or maybe it's Nazir, you know, he, like a Nazarite vow. It's like none of those work. Really what it likely is, if you were called a Nazarene, um, it's like, oh, you're like despised. It's like, you're from that town? Uh, you remember John chapter 1 when Nathaniel, um, Philip told Nathaniel, oh, we found the Messiah, he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's like, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Who, who's from that dumpy town? Oh, this is a colloquial way of saying he will be despised and rejected. He'll be called a Nazarene. That's what the prophet said. He will be despised. He'll be rejected. In other words, he'll be called, oh, you're a Nazarene. And Jesus said, you know what? If you're in the world, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. It is going to reject us. And, and, it, and we will face that opposition. But we don't need to be afraid. Because he was born into this world as one of us. To be born in us. That we might be born again. He makes us a new creation. As we trust in him. We are united to him. And we are new people. We are declared to be the sons and daughters of the heavenly father. United to Christ so that it is in him. Just like Mary and Joseph holding that precious baby. Wherever they went with the child they were safe. They were protected. They had peace. The same is true with us. United to Christ, our King, under His reign, His provision. No matter how dark things may get and apocalyptic scenarios spewed out by the tyrants of man, this King will keep us safe in the new year. He will lead and guide us in His plan of redemption to bring the nations to Himself. And so I want to give you a few promises and then I want to end with a story. Listen to this promise that Paul gives in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He's speaking to Christians at the congregation in Thessalonica. And he says, pray also that we may be rescued from evil and wicked people. For not everyone has faith. Still, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and protect you from the evil one. We also have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we are telling you. Now notice that. Trust that the Lord will protect you. Obey the words we've told you that you would follow Jesus. And I want you to pray. And then from 1 John 5, 18, we know that anyone who's been born of God does not go on sinning. You can't just keep rebelling against God and not have a problem with it. He's just like, oh, it's going to bother you. It's going to convict you. You're, you're going to turn in repentance and, and want forgiveness and, and live free of it, even though we're going to continue to struggle with sin. But you can't keep going on in it. But the one who was born of God, the one, Jesus, protects him. He protects you. And the evil one cannot take hold of him. I want you to get that. The evil one cannot get his claws in you. He will protect you. And then the final promise, 2 Timothy 4, 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil work. When you hear that again, the Lord will rescue me. He will rescue you from every evil work and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Three things for the new year. Trust in the promises of God in Christ Jesus. Those promises. He will guard and protect you no matter how horrific, apocalyptic. I'm not even going to prognosticate or say what's going to happen other than, you know, it might not be that good. But you know what? We don't need to be afraid. Hold on to those promises. 
to follow Jesus. He wants us to look like him. He wants us to radiate his love, his grace, that others lost in the darkness might be rescued and brought into his saving life. And three, pray. Pray. As the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, gives us that spirit of adoption, whereby through Jesus, who redeemed us, who paid the price to set us free, we cry out, Abba, Father. Trust, follow, and pray. He will provide for you. Just as he did for a woman I met with yesterday. The Lord connected me with a woman from Muskegon yesterday who uh, she needed help. And so I gave her some agape assistance. She had... uh, She's a nurse, but she had to quit her nursing job during COVID because she wouldn't comply with the mandate. One thing led to another. She lost her house. It burned down. She ended up living out of her car and had a job, makeshift job at Dollar General in Muskegon Heights, um, (laughs) practically dodging bullets, um, facing weapons pulled out, all this, so. So here, and I, I told Tracy, oh, I'll probably be gone for 40 minutes. Two hours later, she's probably like, where is he? He said, you won't be gone 40 minutes. Well, she shared her story with me. This is a dedicated follower of Jesus who has been through hell and yet has sought to minister to people, um, even on the streets. She opened up a whole vista of the evil that is present on the streets and in cities like Muskegon or Grand Haven with child sex trafficking and prostitution and drugs. And I mean, but she saw it all. And it's just like, whoa. And she said, I, I don't know why I'm telling you this story. I, it's like the Lord wants me to share this with you. Um, and she said, well, you know, my home burned down because I was out of the country. She had been on a medical missions trip to Romania, a long story short, um, a man who had talked her into doing a medical missions trip in Romania, who appeared to be a good Christian man, was not. And she and other nurses went to Romania, and um, she didn't think it suspicious that he got her ticket. All the others bought theirs. Well, at the end of their time, they were able to go back, but she couldn't because the ticket was under his name and he tried to assault her and he was going to sell her into sex trafficking in Romania. Um, Yeah, she's telling me all this. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, She ended up on the run because she contacted the airport. I'm not sure how this works, but she said, I was not authorized to even be in Romania And at first, the embassy just, they couldn't give me any help. And she ended up on the run from this man who was trying to apprehend her because she had exposed, because he had tried to assault her. And so here's this dear Christian woman on the run in a foreign country. A man is hunting her down, either to sell her uh, human sex trafficking or eliminate her. And he has connections, and the police are after her. And um, she goes from one village to another, and one Christian family takes her in, and others are like, no, we can't help you, because they know she's dangerous. And uh, finally, near the end, connecting with Christian friends here in the States, and finally with the U.S. Embassy, she made it back. But all along the way, she's like, I just prayed, and I just prayed, Lord, provide me, keep me safe. And the Lord did. He kept her safe all the way to coming back here to the States, And it was while she was gone that her house burned to the ground. It was arson. And having lived in her car, and I hand her this check, and she says, what do I need to do to pay you back? What can I do for Lakeshore? I said, nothing. This is a free gift. No strings attached. And she just cried. And she said, that's the grace of God. That's the grace of God that kept me safe the whole time I was on the run. And that now she has a job as a nurse, was going to have her car repossessed, but 
wasn't going to get her first paycheck in time. But God provided for her. Through that horrific evil. And she said, I don't know why, I have to tell, why I'm telling you this, but I think you need to share it. Whatever horrific evil we face in this new year, the Lord will provide. He will protect. He will be your peace. Amen? Please stand.